Alan and Sean here from the Prancing Pony Podcast welcoming you to the Tolkien Experience Podcast. The Tolkien Experience Podcast is an attempt to bring the fan and scholarly communities together around our shared passion, the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. Each episode features a notable scholar or member of the fan community sharing their Tolkien experience. And now we'll send you over to Sarah and Luke. Thanks, Alan. I'm Luke Shelton. And I'm Sarah Brown. Every other week, we share with you an interview of a Tolkien scholar or fan. That's right. In these interviews, one of us asks our guests to respond to six questions that help us learn about their personal Tolkien experience. We are so excited to share this podcast with you. So without any further delay, let me introduce our guest. For this episode, I had the privilege of sitting down to talk to Margaret Killjoy. Margaret is well known for her book length and shorter fiction, as well as her nonfiction writing. Probably the most pertinent for us Tolkien fans is her recent short story, The Free Orcs of Cascadia, published in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction in 2019. In addition to her writing credentials, she's also very involved in the metal genre of music. Perhaps, again, the most pertinent for us Tolkien fans is her band Feminazgul. Well, without any further delay, we'll jump right into the interview, and I'll let her tell you a little bit more about the way that Tolkien influenced her, and how she still sees those influences on her writing and her music. So, Margaret, would you mind sharing with us how you were first introduced to Tolkien's work? Yeah, I think probably the first time I became aware of Tolkien's work was a a puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle, at my, my grandmother's house of Middle Earth, a map of Middle Earth. And putting together that puzzle was this like, you know, unlocking of, of the idea of fantasy maps. I was very young. It was before I had uh, really read any any fiction of note. And then basically as a kid, I, I read The Hobbit over and over again. Um, I actually didn't get to Lord of the Rings itself until I was uh, an adult. And the first time I read Lord of the Rings was actually... Uh, I was doing forest defense in Southern Oregon where you, where we tree sat and blocked roads and tried to prevent people from cutting down old growth forests. And I took the job of basically sentry where I crouched behind a log in the middle of the night to keep track of whether cops and feds were going to raid us. And so by the, the red light of a headlamp, I read Lord of the Rings and that was a, a very good place to be introduced to Lord of the Rings more directly. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that that particular setting, the more environmentally friendly themes probably stood out to you a good bit. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The, the Lord of the Rings movies came out while I was a forest defender and, um, you know, when the, the ends go, uh, March, uh, basically everyone that I, I knew would like get up and, yeah, scream and holler in the movie theater and be very in, in, very impolite, but mm. people get really excited about that. And yeah, I was in a band at the time that did a version of the the Ents marching song. Mm. Yeah, I could I could sense that being really resonant in the music scene. The whole like with Doom We Come was a really resounding thing for me reading the books when I was growing up. Yeah. So that first reading of The Lord of the Rings, is that your fondest experience reading Tolkien, or is there another one that stands out? I think that's probably my fondest experience of it. But it's funny because it wasn't... So when I I read Tolkien when I was young, it was this unfolding of magic. It was this... um, It was, you know, reading The Hobbit was when I kind of fell in love with fantasy. And so that, in some ways, was more like fond... Whereas reading Lord of the Rings as a as a young adult was much more of a moving experience. It wasn't it wasn't necessarily even pleasant. It was it was beautiful, but kind of in a dark way. And so the the kind of and that's I mean to me that's how I think of The Hobbit versus The Lord of the Rings anyway is you know this this sort of youthful story, this kind of coddled story that still sort of revolves around the Shire more completely versus this more grim tale that is the Lord of the Rings. So I, I don't have as much of a fondness for Lord of the Rings as I do for uh, for The Hobbit. Mm-hmm. So you kind of foreshadowed one of my other questions, which is, um, has your approach to Tolkien's work changed over time? Yeah, I, 
even when I first kind of read Lord of the Rings, it was still on some level this this fantasy escape and this just like, you know, here's a, a beautiful epic story well told. And by that point I had read a lot of other fantasy and and so in a lot of ways, you know, so much work is derivative of Tolkien that in some ways reading Tolkien then it, it, I, I almost missed some of it because I it felt derivative even though I mean even though it was the other way around, you know. And yet I found something kind of more resonant, more deeply resonant within Lord of the Rings, not even necessarily in the prose, like in the writing, but just in the story itself that has stuck with me as a lot of other fantasy and fantasy tropes have kind of fallen off the wayside in terms of what actually impacts my life and impacts the the themes and the sort of magic that I care about. Yeah. And so um, one of my other questions kind of digs into that a bit more. So what is that um, favorite part of the work that keeps influencing your life and keeps pulling you back to Tolkien? So one of the things that I think that so many things that try and derive from Tolkien miss is Tolkien's critique of power. The, the central point of the Lord of the Rings is that this ring of power must be destroyed. It must, you know, go back where it came from and be obliterated and that you can't wield it against other people. And, and the ring is not violence. Like I've seen some stuff that derives from it that, that basically makes a pacifist argument, but I, I, I think it would take a very strange reading of Tolkien to find pacifism in it. And, and I'm not a, a pacifist personally, but I am interested in the, the, destruction of uh, authoritarianism and power. And so that concept and also something that ties into that is how one of the other kind of central themes of the book is that you have on one hand, a loose collection of different nations and people and individuals. And on the other hand, you have an absolute hierarchy and so instead of creating an absolute hierarchy to go destroy, you know, um, go destroy Sauron, instead people come together. And so this idea of basically like solidarity instead of unity is something that resonates with me really deeply. And so I, I, I continue to care about, you know, I, I sort of joke about it at this point, but it's still true that anytime I watch the Lord of the Rings movies when the, when the writers of, of Rohan show up at Gondor and, you know, scream death, death, death and, and charge into an endless sea of, of orcs. Like it makes me cry. And, you know, um, I'm going to get some names mixed up and all of your fans are going to be really mad at me. But, you know, when the elves show up at Helm's Deep, it's a similar thing. Like there's something about solidarity and specifically showing solidarity with people who didn't show it to you. You know, the, the elves showing up to, to help the humans or the, the Rohirrim showing up to help Gondor when Gondor didn't come to their aid. You know, that is something that is deeper than what, than what mainstream society talks about and what the themes available to us in most contemporary literature and, uh, and media talk about. And I think that there's something to that sort of grimness, which is actually funny because, I mean, Tolkien, you know, I also, at the same time as I, I love Lord of the Rings, I have intense criticisms of Tolkien and Lord of the Rings. And I, I resonate actually some with Michael Moorcock's uh, The Epic Pooh, the essay where he just <laughs> tears apart Tolkien. And, mm -hmm. which is also ironic because Moorcock is maybe the other most influential fantasy trope creator you know D, D is actually more based on moorcock than it is on tolkien i would argue um and it's just as cheesy but there's still something there's something to tolkien's writing that gets at this deeper darker stuff than most of what i get to see now even if moorcock's critique is that tolkien didn't you know he, he kind of whitewashed the the fairy story, he whitewashed the, the epic fantasy, which I haven't read enough pre-Tolkien 
fantasy to really say whether I agree with or not. Hmm. So these these big themes that you've said are the ones that kind of pull you in the kind of uh, dethronement of power and the kind of solidarity of uh, diverse groups. Are those mm-hmm. things that have influenced your own writing or your own music? Yeah, and you know, and obviously I'm going to pull out of Tolkien what I'm predisposed to pull out of Tolkien. Uh, I've been an anarchist for coming on 20 years, and which for me is about diverse groups of people working together in solidarity and it's not a not an individualist thing for me um and so you know in a lot of ways i I use tolkien to kind of prop up the the themes of my own writing and my own music but it's it's hard to hmm. sometimes it's hard to piece together exactly what I'm writing because I'm inspired by having read something or whether something that someone else has written resonates with things that I'm already thinking. Mm. It gets really, it gets really messy. It's it's kind of hard for me to pull apart sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, a kind of more specific question I have for you is um, mm. one of your bands is named Feminazgul. Mm-hmm. And I saw an interview about that band, how, uh, you were describing some of the the ideas behind the name of that band, and I wondered if you wouldn't mind sharing some of that with our listeners. Sure. So I have this band called Feminine School, and it, I mean, it, the name is a joke. The name is, is you know, there's this, the, a joke that's been going around for a long time. I'm not a feminazi, I'm a feminine school. Mm-hmm. And I knew that once I came out as trans, I was probably going to name a black metal band Feminine School. <laughs> and and but like a lot of things that I do is both a joke and not. The music itself is not in any way a parody or a joke. And in a lot of ways the the point of naming the band this way, uh black metal is very heavily influenced by Tolkien in both the right and left wing. Like some two of the most important black metal musicians on the on the far right, you have Burzum, who's named for the black speech word for darkness and on the on the left you have summoning who um you know has bad album names like minas morgul and has is very very steeped in middle earth um and so in some ways this is a, a provocation to black metal which is unfortunately both right and left wing tends to be towards uh fairly misogynist and at least very male dominated and so first starting off as, as one trans woman and now there's a another woman in my band. Um, Feminine School was kind of a a cry against that. But from a thematic point of view, I mean, it's interesting, right? Because the Nazgul are not good. And by my own critique of power, the Nazgul don't, you know, they are not good. They're the, the kings who have sworn their allegiance. Again, I'm going to get the mythology wrong and all your fans are going to hate me. Um, but I, I like the idea of an inversion of the Nazgul. I like the idea of these people who are tracking down the ring of power in order to get it out of the hands of men. And I, I think there's a particular irony in that Tolkien, you know, which is, I believe, the style at the time. I'm not trying to specifically lambast him for this. Very much like referred to humanity as men constantly, mm-hmm. you know? And so our, our albums come off of basically play off of that. You know, we had um, the most recent album is No Dawn for Men. And the one before that is The Age of Men is Over. And so there's something about these like wraiths that are hunting down men to steal power away from them that that resonates with me. But to some degree that's a backwards approach like I knew I wanted to make this provocation by naming my band Feminine School and you know since then I've looked for meaning within that yeah sounds like you've really done the work to not only form your opinions about the work but also it sounds like you've done a lot of reflection on how you arrived at those opinions Mm -hmm. and it, it sounds like that's led you to kind of a, an even deeper appreciation for it, understanding your own process. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And I also, even like my own, say my, my criticisms of Tolkien, they they don't, in some ways they also deepen my appreciation of the work because I don't 
put him on a pedestal, mm. it allows me to it, it allows it to become more true because of the fact that it's it's flawed and that I also resonate with all kinds of critiques that you know people have have put down and. You know, I, I'm really interested in the inversion of, for example, the orc, like the orc as the proletarian and, you know, because Tolkien works in this very romantic sense, right? It's very uh, a criticism of industrialization um, and theoretically it's mostly a criti- uh, criticism of, you know, this sort of blind industrialization, this, uh, you know, authoritarian industrialization but it's still there it's this, this, these romantic concepts and, and i heavily identify with romanticism but it's also something that that people who are my ideological enemies like nazis also appreciate and uh and so i i kind of like the figure of the orc and i like the figure you know I'm, i've also always been interested in the idea of making the monstrous the the um protagonizing the monstrous mm. and I, I you know i think that's something that there's a lot of room to be done in in response to tolkien mm-hmm. yeah a lot of what you've said really resonated with my um my first post back study was in early british literature mm-hmm. ah, so you do know about what he what he did and responded to yeah, um, a little bit. I I, I worked with uh, Beowulf, and okay. th- through that was exposed to um, monster studies. Um, mm-hmm. And there's this whole cool. field that's all about you know the, um, the monster has historically been othered, and so let's examine like let's look at Beowulf as essentially a, a political text where they have an ideology that is anti-monster. Mm-hmm. And then work to figure out, okay, then what assumptions is the text making that's othering the monster, and how can we deconstruct that? Um, yeah. And that sounds a lot like what you're talking about, of just, you know, basically bringing in the, the monstrous or the other and trying to look for the positive aspects of it, maybe even reframe the narrative around it. Yeah. No, I, I love that stuff. There was this, this text that's kind of been kind of unpublished by the author of the zine and the author has since, and the, the anonymous author has since kind of said that they don't totally, they don't really want people to distribute it anymore. I guess their thoughts about the whole thing have, have moved on, but there's a, a zine called Orc and it's basically the self as monster and it's coming at this position. Um, you know, the, the author is trans and I'm trans and there's a lot of other, uh, other elements that, you know, there's a lot of things that can make one a monster in our society by being racialized by our society, by being, you know, put into these monstrous gender categories, et cetera. And, and it, and it, I love how it pulls that apart and, and talks about how, you know, this author, when they were, when they were coming up, they'd, they'd read all these monster stories and they would definitely, they would identify with the monsters. Hmm. And, and I'm really interested in that. So um, that's cool that people have done the same with Beowulf and and other things like that. Mm-hmm. So, um, sorry, I kind of sidetracked this a little bit, but mm-hmm. um, to get back to, you were talking about how um, you don't put Tolkien on a pedestal. You see him as a real person, and that kind of leads more depth to his story. Um, mm-hmm. But then that also means that the the last question that I normally ask my text-based participants um, might mm-hmm. be a little more complicated for you than it mm-hmm. is for people who do put Tolkien on a pedestal. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm really interested to hear about whether or not you ever recommend Tolkien and and why or why not. So I do recommend Tolkien because I want to trust people to think critically. You know, I don't want to say like, oh, this is complicated, don't read it, you know? And also because for me, the themes that do resonate resonate so strongly. And even the things that don't resonate make me think so much that, yeah, I, I, I recommend Tolkien. Um, you know, I don't, um, I haven't read The Similarian. That's, the, that, that's in my, <laughs> I'm afraid that I'm, 
you know, that uh, everyone's going to realize that I'm, I'm not, I've said this multiple times that I'm, I'm clearly steeped in this stuff, but I'm not fully, I tend to get interested in things, find the things that are beautiful and meaningful to me and, and dive deeper into those rather mm-hmm. than like necessarily creating a whole breadth of understanding of a subject. And, but I, I do, you know, I rec- I recommend Tolkien in that I also recommend people, yeah, think critically about it. I, I, in a short story I wrote, I once called Tolkien the most influential, unconsciously racist author of the 20th century. Hmm. And, you know, maybe there's other authors who are unconsciously racist. And, and I think Tolkien fought for anti-racism. And I, you know, love his letter to the the Third Reich where they were, I don't remember, it was like something where he was like, no, you can't translate my shit into German because I'm like, because you're anti-Semitic, you. Um, I don't remember the the details of that letter, but I, you know, it, it and and so I think Tolkien absolutely was trying to be on uh, the side of, of humanity. And yet, you know, he creates this uh, anti-Semitic dwarf trope that, you know, doesn't do anyone any good and ties into thousands of years of the way that the Christian church and especially early capitalism have basically forced Jewish people into um, situations where they can be demonized and attacked by, you know, by the church banning ursary and then being like, well, Jews can be bankers then. And then basically anytime peasants were like, wait, we actually hate everything. And they get mad at the Lords, you know, the, the Lords can be like, ah, it's the Jews. And then you have pogroms and, you know, and so playing into those stereotypes doesn't, doesn't, doesn't do anyone any good. Right. Mm -hmm. And of course the fact that these like Middle Eastern people are roughly analogous with orcs in (laughs) Lord of the Rings is like, not doing anyone any good and uh the movies didn't really do any favors with this you know ridiculously white cast and the maori orcs is my understanding of it and and yet his goal i think on so many ways is about diverse people coming together to fight for everyone's freedom you know and so i I think that there's, there's still a beauty and a value in that. Hmm. Well, one of the things that, you know, I told you when I asked you to do this interview is that mm-hmm. our podcast, what we want it to be is a celebration of people's personal experiences. Mm-hmm. And with that comes the understanding that, of course, not all of us have read all of the exact same things. Um, <laughs> and so don't, don't apologize for what you haven't read. It's okay. just, you haven't read it. <laughs> Um, yeah. Okay. And we're we're really trying to make a, a podcast that that shows a a great range of interpretation and a great range of opinion. Um, cool. And so, yeah, absolutely. The the movies particularly were roundly criticized for several of the choices that they made that kind of took these um, possibly um, unintentional choices by Tolkien and made them very intentional choices by the people who created the movies, like. Um, yeah, adopting the Maori dances as part of the orc scenes or, you know, having orcs who have dreadlocks, those kinds of things that are coded racially. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I think what you pointed out is something that, you know, it's not only your interpretation, because if it was only your interpretation, the directors wouldn't have made those decisions that highlighted those things that were already in the text to some extent. Um, yeah. And so I think, you know, everyone has their unique experience, and that's what we're here to celebrate. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, and is it good? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to ask the last question, but I'm interested in what you're going to say. Well, to, to talk about the, like, balance of, of Tolkien and why it's so influential to me, I think of, there was a letter he wrote his son, and I'm, I'm going to mangle it. I don't remember it exactly, but, you know, he, he wrote his son and said, the older I get, I become more and more of an anarchist. And mm-hmm. he then says, you know, by that I mean, uh, I don't remember, by that I mean the political idea, not bearded men with bombs. And then, you know, uh, 
the worst the worst job for any man is to rule other men. Not one in a million is fit for it, at least of all those who who wish to do it. Mm-hmm. And but in that same letter, he also says, I'm, "I'm more and more of an anarchist or a monarchist." And I, I wish I remember. I should have re looked this up. But that tension between a, a monarchist and an anarchist is, of course, why it, it's it's hugely wide. There's a huge gap between an anarchist and a monarchist. And yet here's someone who shows sympathies to both. And that's one of the things that I think makes Tolkien so relevant right now is that there is a resonance with sort of nationalism and anti-nationalism or internationalism within his work that I think is is hugely important right now, where I think we're on the, the cusp between basically societies learning how to work together as diverse and equal or kind of breaking down into a nationalist paradigm where people are like, well, I've got mine. So fuck you. I actually didn't ask whether I can cuss on this show. Sorry. Um, and, and so that's something that I, I think that, and you get into the same idea of this romanticism. Romanticism is hugely important both to sort of pro-social thinkers and also freedom minded thinkers as well as fascists and nationalists, this, this romanticization of pre-industrial life. And it, that's, that's one of the things that's so fascinating to me is that this is a, a well of mythology that so many people come to, to drink from. And it matters to me that Tolkien, I believe is much more on my side than the fascist side, you know, and I, I think that both, the themes of his work and also his writings about his work would bolster my, my interpretation. But I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that. Hmm. So, yeah, it, I agree. I, I think that Tolkien does have something where he's still resonant and per- perhaps even more resonant now because there's a tension that we're seeing in society. Um, yeah. It, um, reminds me of this great essay that Verlin Flieger delivered last year, um, where it thought about Tolkien as a keystone in an arch. Okay. Uh, so he is the the top point, and there are tensions pressing on both sides. Yeah. Um, and instead of instead of seeing Tolkien as he's all one or he's all the other, um, we have to see him as perhaps the way we should see everyone else as just a composite of tensions that they're trying to hold together. I think that's a really brilliant way to look at it. So I should probably move us into our last question so I don't keep you for too long. Mm -hmm. Um, But what Tolkien-inspired projects are you working on right now that maybe our listeners could get involved with? So the the easiest, maybe, well, as I say, the most accessible, but that depends on your interest in various types of metal and people screaming, uh, is my, my band Feminine School, which is me and Laura Beach. And we just put out an album a month ago, kind of whenever, shortly after I started not leaving the house anymore, whenever that was, time has kind of lost all meaning. Uh, and, and while, and, and, you know, the themes are, are heavily inspired by Tolkien, but only look, look not to Erebor is the only you know song that's specifically Tolkien inspired, but, uh, certainly carried throughout the themes of the book and then, uh, or the, sorry, the album. And then the other thing I do, I actually make most of my money as a, as a fiction writer, and a little bit as a nonfiction writer and a little bit as a musician. But I, I would say the most directly Tolkien influenced writing that I've done is a short story called the free orcs of Cascadia that came out in um, about a year ago maybe a year and a half ago in the magazine of science fiction and fantasy. And you can either find a back issue of that, or if you subscribe to my Patreon, you have access to a, a ton of my stories. And it describes something about basically a society of people who declare themselves to be orcs and move into burned forests in Cascadia. Uh, the story is called the free orcs of Cascadia. And it's about this tension that you were just talking about in which the orc society, which is, you know, these aren't 
it's not a fantasy story. It's a science fiction story. People have just basically declared themselves free of our society and have started an alternate society. And within it, there's a, a split and now a war between the matriarchal orcs and the patriarchal orcs and the, essentially the sort of like communitarian orcs versus uh, the fascistic orcs. And that's, and you know, they all, they all speak in dark speech and they call it dark speech instead of black speech because they feel as though Tolkien wouldn't have meant the racial implications that he unconsciously created and, and all of these things. Um, and so that story is available on my Patreon or in the magazine Science Fiction and Fantasy. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Well, I appreciate so much your willingness to come on and share with us some of your Tolkien experience. Yeah, thanks for having me and, and thanks for doing this work. We are so thankful that we have such gracious scholars and fans who want to share their Tolkien experience with us and with you. We have a lot of fun making these podcasts. So much fun. It's always exciting to talk to fans and scholars about their Tolkien experience. If you want to know more about the ways to connect with this episode's guests that they mentioned in this interview, we provide show notes at TolkienExperience.com. Also, don't forget to follow the podcast on your favorite social media sites. That's right. We're on Facebook as Tolkien Experience, and also on Twitter as at Tolkien EXP. So don't forget to like, follow, share, and comment, because we love interacting with you just as much as we enjoy talking with our guests. You can also follow our personal Twitter accounts. I am at Luke B. Shelton. You can also look for me on Twitter, where I am at Aaron L. Palmerdil. You can find the podcast on all major podcast services, including Apple, Stitcher, and YouTube. Thank you for listening to our podcast. We truly hope that, in a way, it contributes to your own Tolkien experience.